Okay, let's make sure I'm actually streaming now. Okay, welcome back to the Caribou Data Science Channel. This is the evening of, the evening of uh, Monday, September, January 9th, 2023. We're going to continue to this evening to work on our, work on the uh, World Quant uh, University's Data Science Lab project. Good news is we finished Module 1 and it's on the Module 2 now, okay? So sit back, we'll actually back you folks in like 15 minutes, okay?
Okay. This, now I should have a Bible app up here someplace. Let's go one more time. Okay, well, the, the news, the big news for today is I got me a new, uh, a new phone. Uh, this is a uh, Samsung. I think it's called a Note or something like that, Notepad maybe. Uh, it even comes, it even comes with a, uh, with a little stylus type of thing. It's a better phone than I had last time, a little faster, more memory, uh, nice bright screen. Uh, I, 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 you know, the trouble was I was, uh, the, the trouble was that my phone, hey, how you doing? Uh, my phone stopped working. I kept dropping calls and it was an older phone and it wasn't supported anymore. And as fate would have it, uh, I only had, only had one more payment left on the old phone. So I said, you know what, let's just get a new phone. Really mess around with it. Of course, in addition to getting a new phone, I also upgraded my my uh, my phone plan. So I now got 5G data on my phone. And it's unlimited, unlimited, uh, unlimited internet, talk and text, and all kinds of happy stuff like that. So so far, it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Uh, uh, but anyway, so that 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 was a that was like a three hour trip to the Verizon store today. <laughs> uh, Oh, hey Hassan, how you doing? I just saw your message here. Yeah, that's a, and that's a, and that's a, that's a good start. That, that, that you, you, you're definitely on your way now. You know, I, I always think that the hardest thing of, of any program is the, is the first couple lines, and, that, and that's why if you start out with like you did with with loading the libraries, okay, and then loading the data, well, you you just made a couple of pretty good steps. Uh, now, what you can't now, the question is, what exactly did your instructor want you to do? Because basically, the column headings are a piece of crap. Okay, I mean, they're, they're like these huge, long column headings. And I'm not really sure what your instructor is really looking for. Let's take another look at the... Uh, now, you can also take a look at that... Uh, at that code I sent you the other night, the, 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 uh, the module code. All, most of that code in there, you you can. Uh, I'm not showing screen. Okay. Okay. How's that? 
Can you see me now? Okay, good. Uh, well, the good news is I did finish the first module of the of the uh, of that course I'm taking on the uh, on the World Quant University site, the, the Data Science Lab. I actually completed the first module. Now it's on the module two, which has to deal, I think, a lot with like uh, predictive model, a little bit of predictive models, linear regressions, and stuff like that, regression model. Uh, let's take a look at this here real quick. So remember, when you use pandas, right, what this does, it creates a data frame, okay, not, not a matrix or a list, okay. So I'm not sure this right here is what you're looking for. But anyway, you also don't need, you don't necessarily need this, okay. But you can leave it there. I don't think I heard anything, but it doesn't actually, isn't actually required. So this creates a data frame. So what you want to do, you want to use the functions you have. Uh, on the data frame. So let me just open up code here real quick. See what this does. Now remember, I, uh, your best friend is that uh, OpenAI chat uh, bot, okay? Because it knows a lot, that, that, that chat bot knows a lot more than I do about, about Python programming. I'm using, I'm using code. And I'm, I'm creating a notebook. Now this, now this notebook may, in fact, work with like uh, what you're working with, also, whether you Jupyter or something like this. Uh, it's possible that uh, Jupyter may, you may be able to port this directly into Jupyter. So I, did, I just loaded a couple of things up here. I loaded Glob. Let me, let me come down here, okay? And I just and I just come in here and, and I just I got this code right off of uh, that chat program, okay? Uh, so we can load this. Now, what this does, this loads both files in, and then, then it combines them into a single data frame, okay? Because that's, that's, what what, that's what you're supposed to do, I believe. You're supposed to combine two, two, two files in, into a single data frame. And you can do that with something as simple as this, where, uh, well, this is an interesting way of doing it. Actually, you don't have to do it this way. Uh, Let's just take a look at something here first. You can use the uh, well. If, if if you look at that document I sent you, um, okay. So what I did over here is. See, this is good up here. Uh, so, 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 how how would you read this into an SQLite database? Well, you go again. You go to that chat program. Okay, I'll give that to you again. I mean, this. Yeah, you. This, this thing here, as, as the old saying goes, uh, open AI and me know everything there is to know in the world. Open AI, open AI knows, it all, knows it all and I know the rest. So we come over here and we say, Okay. So 
So this is going to create a database. Well, you, you can you can call us whatever you want to, right? But this is this is. Uh, but all I did, as you saw, I I I just typed my question into into the into the chat window and hit return. Okay. Their shape. Now let's do a head. Okay. And 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 this is always going to be the name of your data frame, whatever you whatever you call your data frame. Okay. And if you take a look at that dot at that that MD file I sent you last night, all you got to do is take some of those commands. Change change the name of the database, and most of those commands is going to work out of the box. Okay, let's take a look at this. Here's the problem right here, and, I, I, and this is where the crap all comes in. I mean, this this is ridiculous. Okay, they have long titles like that. So there's five rows, thirty five columns. Okay. So let's come up here, and what one thing you can always do is just just to uh, you know just to just to get things started. You you, you could do mine CSV. Remember that number nine hundred forty four rows, thirty five columns. Okay. In place. In place me in place means you're actually gonna make changes directly to the to the to the uh, to the data to the data frame. Okay. But you, you could you could for instance take this and just pipe it back out over, over top of itself or pipe it out even to a new data frame if you wanted to. Let me close. All right. Let's do this now. 944 and 35. Well, that's not good. What? <laughs> if you get rid of the NAs, you lose all your data. Jeez. All right. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Convert what into Boolean? Let's let's take a look at the. Uh, Oh, um, I don't know. Ask uh, ask the chat program. <laughs> okay, that's why that's why I keep telling you to go to the chat program. That, you know, Python pandas. You know how how do I do this? Hey, Jorg, how you doing, friend? Welcome back. We're, we're, we're trying to muck around with a little bit of uh, Python here, trying to figure out how how what best to do with this data. Uh, see, here's the thing. If if you read the code. It's, it sounded like uh, these are supposed to be in the, you're supposed to have one data frame for each column. Okay. Now notice here you have three things in the column here. You have GPS, you have a missing value, and sometimes you have a yeah, sometimes you have an X. All right. But like I said, if you get rid of them all.
Let's see. Bonds. Columns. So we want to take a look what our columns are. So we've got this massive long thing here. Okay. Let's take a look at this. You know, this, uh, if, we, if we did something with these data, with these labels up here somehow. So tell me, George, are, are, you, a, uh, are you a Python programmer by chance? Where did I put the... Uh, You did this, although you need to. Um,
Okay. This is what I'm not quite sure about. Utilize the column headings of, of the data frame. So the first thing you want to do, you have to write them into a separate, into one separate file. So here's the thing. Does this mean combine the two files into one separate file? That's to see again that the way it's stated, that's a little confusing. Write them into one separate file, one separate data frame. So does that mean to combine them into a single data frame or what? Uh, and it says utilize column headings of the data frame to store some details of each session into the new data frame. Create a copy of the original data frame to keep clean data. Rename the columns of the data frame so that their, that their names are short and each column has a unique session ID. Well, uh, in all honesty, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, now there is something you can do, okay? Uh, <laughs> See, because he wants you to create this database, but you, but you have to clean the data frames first, okay? What you could do is you, you, you can come down to this step here, or down to this step here, right? And then, and then write the thing out to a, to a uh, Excel file and, and then go into the column headings in Excel and clean the column headings up in there. Because I really think to try to, to, to clean them column headings up here would be an absolute mess. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's uh, and, it, and plus your structure doesn't say you have to use Python for everything. So you, you could do, again, it's, it's a very, it's a very simple thing. You just take the dot pd dot underscore okay. The right to Excel. And then you just say, uh, right? And, and, th and this is going, and this is going to write this uh, Excel file in, into the same directory where the data is located at. So let's see what we do this. Oh. All right. Then come back over here. Right, and here's our and here's our headings. Okay. And this must be the student ID, right?
that's Monday. So this is Monday morning. This is Wednesday morning. Well, you know, what you could do is come in here. Let's just insert a, a column here. You could do this. Right? But like I said, I don't understand. I don't understand. He's supposed to read the data from each CSV file and write them into one separate data frame. So it sounds like he wants these that could be combined into one data frame. Okay. And the way you do that is you just, you just use the PD concat command. All right. Except here, the, except here, you just you would just use name your data frame. Okay. And you would simply say square brackets. And what what would be your first data frame is called? All right, so it's data frame. It's DF1. I'm a DF. Two, okay. And then, then you, then you would have, then you have your combined data frame.
Okay. What you might be able to do is this. Simply just keep this. But you shouldn't have uh, you, you shouldn't have S1 W1 Monday more than once. Because then it's uh S1 W1 uh, Wednesday, S1 W2 Wednesday, and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what could we do here? What could we do? All right. So you could come back over here. A again, you know, that's... Uh, now, there's a... There, there, you know, there probably is a way for us to actually... Uh, I mean, fix some of this code. Okay, let's be honest about it. There, there, there certainly is, but you know, how much do we really want to do? <laughs> That's the question. Okay. So come over here. Yeah, and again, there's a you know this this is kind of sucks, but uh, I I think it's quicker than uh, <laughs> trying to figure out how to write the, the code. I mean, the, you can certainly do this all within Python. Uh, you can use like a string replace of some type, but uh, ultimately, it's uh, And you can see this, this isn't taking that long. Is there any way you can ask your, ask your instructor to make sure? Because he says one file. The instructor says one file. Okay. That's, a, that's what I don't know. Because he says file and, and write them into one separate data frame. Is there a way you can ask your instructor just to clarify it? Yeah, but I'm not sure that's the problem. Okay, let's close this one more time. <laughs> Come back over here. And all. Uh, and then once you say the next line, it, now then it says you uh, utilize the column headings of the data frame. 
and store the details of each session, each session, into a new data frame. All right. Co create a copy of the rich data frame to keep the clean data. What isn't cleaned yet? Rename the columns of the data frame so that, so that the names are short in each column. If, it, if the record of the student data frame is always null. Okay, so what, what's this mean up here? Is he, is he saying he wants a separate data frame for each column? I mean, again, they, they, these, these are questions for your instructor. I mean, the, the, the instructions are not very good. So we're going to do this. We're going to save this. Did you have any type of you know textbook or anything with, the, with this course that shows you how to do this stuff? Or we could have done, or you can do this also. You could, you could have just kept the, uh, the Tuesday lecture and the number there. What I'm doing here, you know, this is this is this is all part of of uh, data cleaning or data wrangling. So he talks about cleaning the data. Well, that's what that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a little data cleaning. Okay. Now you could you could actually do the whole <laughs> you you could you could clean the whole thing over here in, in Power Query, but uh, but unfortunately that's not what your instructor is looking for. Let's save this. So George, what are you what are you up to this evening, friend?
<laughs> well, I mean, if you, uh, uh, if we try to actually clean this data, uh, in Python, well, it'd probably uh, taken us longer to do it this way. I mean, it'd probably taken longer because I'm not sure exactly how to keep certain pieces of data like this. Hmm. I don't know what SID is. I mean, there's there's a there's different ways you can you can clean these titles. Okay, you could uh, you you could you could keep the um, You know, just this title down here, and then go to the computer lab or something like that. Yeah, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. I mean, you, you could do things like string replace and stuff like that with wild cards, but. But this will work. I'll tell me what matters as it gets done. Is there anybody in your class that could help you with this? Uh -oh. Oh. Okay, so we got two
It's all good. We're almost done. Oops. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, this may not be the best result either, but. You have to keep in mind, I, I'm more of an R programmer than a Python programmer. Okay, well, again, can you ask your instructor? Well, there is a better way. I just don't know what it is. I mean, like I say, I've, you, you got long strings of text here, and you get to decide what you want to what you want to convert, convert them to. Now, again, you know, you really should ask your instructor you, for to clarify what what he's really looking at. What what Instructor's really looking for here, okay? See, because all, all these things here are different. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and pull out all this, okay? Because you, you have to have some way of identifying each column, but he wants you to make the, the, the column he heading shorter, more readable. Personal best.
Okay. Let's come back over here. I don't think we need that. All right. So is this, the, this could be the student ID, or this could be the student ID. Let's save this. Is that right? Okay, so what is it then? <laughs> Let's copy this here.
Oh, shoot. Yeah, we still got these little. Geez. Okay, what these slash ends are? These these are new lines. Okay, so if you were in the original file, the uh, the the column name was divided up in like three lines. Uh, so you you know you, all these things have this thing here. Now, can we get rid of the, the, that? Probably. Uh, But in order to get rid of all these double new lines here, you'd have to write a separate statement. Uh, you know, this something like this is what we're what you'd have to do. Okay, all the way over to here. All right, you replace this with a double new line character. And then you would simply do it. So let's just, let's just try this for one up for the first comment. You can see how to do it. Let's just see if we can do this. Well, we could do. Well, no, because how do we change column name? How do we, how do you rename a column name in the, in Python? Well, again, we come back over here.
So you would have to do something like this. Old name, new name. Old column name. Oh, shoot. Okay. Then we can say the second name. So, you know, and it didn't work. Uh, my guess is. Probably thinks those those are still new lines. Let's try something. But again, you see, this is you know, all, all I'm doing is just trying different things. I don't really know what the correct answer is. That's the most important thing you have to understand. No, you see, I'm trying. I'm trying to get rid of these ends here. Well. We take this. And you see what I'm doing? I, I'm just trying different things. I really don't know what the, I, I'm really not sure how to how to change that. Okay, but Okay, yeah, we could do that. We could. There's the there's one answer. Oh, oh wow! You see what this did here? 
df columns. All right. This, re this returns a list of columns. But see, I, I wouldn't have come with a solution unless, unless I went over and I tried different things. And that's what you have to learn. You have to learn to try different things. Okay. See, I, I wouldn't have known this on my own without if I, if I didn't look it up. How about that? So in one line of code, after spending 30 minutes of looking, okay, uh, uh, I fi we, we, we fixed our problem, okay? Uh, no, because that's not the problem. The problem is, is that the, the actual original data frames were much longer names, okay? The, 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 the original ones also included uh, the time of the class and, and, the, and the number of the, and the ID of the class. So you still have to deal with uh, what, how to deal with the time stuff. Rename them to what? Okay. Okay, let's just come back up here. That's not the problem. Remember, I moved I removed a bunch of text after that, after the number also. So we got this here. And let's just drop this. See, here, here's the original text. So it's more than just removing the, yeah, we, we can remove the new line, but that does give us just one line. That does give us one line. Let's just take a look at this down and see exactly what happens. Okay, once again, here's the head. All right, nope, that's the wrong line. Let's see. See, this is the original headings. That's, that's a multi-line heading. So we come down here, remove all the new lines, but that's not really going to solve the problem. So we still have we still have all the texture you got to deal with, all right. The new lines are gone, but he wanted you to come back and rename the columns. 
So you still have to decide what are you going to do about all this down here. That's the problem. Okay, so where's Yahoo now? Where is hmm. it? Just it didn't seem to copy over my. The thing is this, you have two S1W2 Wednesdays. One's a lecture and one's a tutorial. So you see so at the bare minimum, you got to keep, you know, this and, and that in order, to, in order to identify the column. And that still may not be enough. And, and that's what we did. That's what I did in Excel. Okay. And again, I'm still not what I'm still not sure what he means. Uh, utilize the column ends of the data frames to to store the data of each session into a new data frame. I'm not sure. You know, again, you need to go ask your instructor what 
what what exactly do you mean? You mean you want a different data frame for every single column? Is that what you're talking about? See, I, again, you, these these are questions you need to ask your instructor. That's 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 not this isn't a Python question to understand what exactly your instructor is looking for. Okay, when's this project supposed to be done? Two weeks from when? <laughs> I mean, you have two more weeks? Now, I should have something over here. And the same token is, uh, could you, unless you can use the column function to read all these, read all these numbers over here. Uh, is this a, uh, in, is this actually a, an in-class? A uh, course, or is this actually a uh, a virtual course where you like log on online or something like that?
and rewrite that. Now we're going to create a database and we're going to create a table called my table, hopefully. Okay. So we're, going to, we're going to create a table called my database. Then we're going to then we're going to uh, take the, the the DF data frame and create a table called my table. And if it exists, it's going to replace it. And I don't think we actually need this cursor anymore. Okay. Then we're going to come, then we're going to come back and going to read it. Okay. And create a new table called uh, DF one. So let's see what happens here. Oh, Let's see, it was sorry that I had an error there. Well, here it is. Well, this apparently one. So let's take a look over here inside our database. And there's our database. Yes, but he wants you, but he wants you to use the SQLite database. Okay, you got to create it. That's part of that's part of the package. Okay. So that's what you said. Is, is this is this an in person class or is it, or is it a, a a class over the internet? And there's a table we just created, okay? All right, DF. Uh, 
And there's and so now we just came back over here and we reread that. We, I'll give you this code here because part of your assignment is to is to is to once you clean the data is to put it into it into an SQLite database. Okay, and you can see this is very very simple. Okay, very simple straightforward stuff. So I'll send I'll send this in a text to you. Okay. But so here's what you do. You look at the assignment and you see, or is there something I can do? Because you can, you know, you can maybe do something and then come back to the clean later after you talk to your instructor. Okay. Is, is there anybody in your class? And what you want to do, you want to find a, the best looking girl in your class and ask her for help. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, what was your question here? Okay, was it this up here? What 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 question did it did it ask? I tell you what, I'm going to uh, I'm going to let you go at this point. Uh, like I say, you got you got multiple things you can do. See if it, see if there's something else you another step you can take. Well, we, well, let me come back maybe tomorrow night and take a look at that uh, at the cleaning question again. I'm just not I'm just not sure how to do it because it's me. I mean, because what what we have to remove is different. He said you know take it and and. Uh, and and make them make them you know make a better column manage. Well, I'm not really sure how to do that. Okay, uh, because all the column headings are different. So, so what class is this? Okay, what what class is this? But this this here was a good start. I'm, I'm not really sure what what all this does, exactly. But uh, but you're working with data frames, and you, so you don't want to go to a list. Okay, I wouldn't think so anyway. And the question in terms of how would you come down here, and replace say this with a zero. And. Uh, you got you got the trouble is if if we if we remove the, the NAs here like this, okay? Then then you have, then you then you wish to delete every single row. All right. So in a, and if it's an internet class, they probably have uh some type of message board system set up, you know, so you go and you can post questions to the instructor and post questions to other other classmates, okay? You really your best choice are the other people in your class and your instructor because because they know what they know what you've been taught okay and I don't but this this here again you would have to do it you know it's probably a way to, again to do it so it goes across all columns uh, otherwise you could you could simply do a string replace okay replace GPS with one uh, replace X with zero. Else it's going to be an NA.
You see, and here and here's a basic string replace function. You could come down here. And you know this may work. Let's let's just try something here. Well, except we're doing column names, right? Not columns. Let's do something. Okay, we can use the where function. Now, I wouldn't have known these solutions without looking it up, okay? So. So come back down here then. Oops. Nah. Let's just put it down here. All right, so we can say
the thing about these columns is these these are these these are of course character columns or string columns. Okay, so even if you put an O in there like here, it's still going to be a string column. Okay. And you see what happened there? Now there's what we want to do, we want to try to do it across all the columns. So we'll come back down here. So, yeah, I just went back and asked you the second question. Yeah, so what it's saying here apparently is that you... Uh, you actually have to do it for all, all the individual columns, okay? So let's do this. Let's just change the name of this column here. You see, th this is a non, a non an NA because it's a text column, okay? Now you can see over here, we, we had the three GPSs and, and the X. All right. So you would need to take this command here, apparently. And uh, I don't know, is there, is there a way to do it? Now, nah, it probably is, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so sometimes you just, you just got to do what you have to do to get it done. It may not be pretty. You know, when it, when it wouldn't work, but hey, as long as you get as long as you get the data the way you want it, that's all that matters. Now, again, like I say, what you want to look to is it's like like on this class over here, I'm taking over here, okay, World Quant University. You have a form. Each each section, each 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 lab, each, each module has a form which you can post questions to, okay? And my guess is, if, if this is online, you probably have some type of form for you to discuss the discuss this with your fellow students. You have to look for that also, okay? But uh, that's that's all I can help you tonight for right now. I got some others for, I got to do for my own. Hopefully, I, I, I'll send you a link to this uh, also to the. Uh, to the. Uh, To the replace functions, okay. And that with that, my friend, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to, I'm going to uh, end this session. I'm going to go over and do some do some of my own stuff now. You, you're more than welcome, of course, to stand by and watch past courses, current courses. 
because this is Python again also, okay? And just like you, I'm, I'm learning this stuff as I go along, okay? Okay, I'm going to take a 15 minute break and I'll be back.
Phase two, phase one.
Okay. Okay. Let's come back over here now. Predicting price with size. As you can see, we're, we're adding a few more packages now. Warnings, import map pot lip, pandas, iPods on display, import video, SK Learn, uh, linear model, import linear regression, Psychic Learn metrics, import mean absolute error, Psychic Learn utils validation, import check is fitted. Warning, simple filter, uh, action, ignore, category, future warning. A future warning is kind of interesting. You'll run a command that says future warning, uh, this, this function or whatever is going away in the, in, the, in the near future. So that's also why you want to keep in mind, okay? Uh, okay. And it, and it, it's interesting. You sit up here and, and the... Uh, And they uh, and it tells you whether or not you're you, you got the you answered the question right. So we got all this happy stuff here. Let's just so the question is, have I installed Sidekick Learn? Oh, good. So we already got Psychic Learn installed. Okie dokie now. Okay. In this project, you'll, you'll be, you're working for a client who wants to create a model that can predict the price of apartments in the city of Buenos Aires with a, with a focus on the apartments that cost less than 400000 U.S. dollars. Let's go over here. Let's go back to GitHub. We're going to continue to keep our notes, okay? Okay. Let's just take a look. Well, let's just come up here first. Before we dive into the project, there are two things that I want to draw your attention to. The first is the outline of this notebook, because it's going to be very important in structuring how we think about machine learning problems and building machine learning models. And then the second is I want to introduce you to the new libraries we'll be using in this right. lesson. So with that in mind, let's go. Let's make sure no one's over here. Nick Wan is in the house. Bless a little teeny tiny soul. Over to the notebook here, and if I pull up my um, if I pull up my uh, drawing tool, you can notice that there's this little uh, kind of set of tabs along the right side of your computer. And right now we're here in the file picker tab. And that's the reason why you can see all of these files, mm -hmm. which I'm scrolling over right now. But if you click on this one that looks kind of like bullet points with lines, what that gives you is it gives you the outline of the notebook that you're currently in. So let's take a closer look at these different sections 
Notice that we have uh, three big sections here, preparing data, building model, and communicating results. And these are the three big things you're going to do whenever you build a machine learning model. You're going to get all your data in a form that you can actually use it to create your model. Then you're going to go through the model building process. And when you're all done, you're going to need to communicate those results either with external stakeholders or deploying the model. Now, within these three sections, there are a couple subsections. The first is import. When we talk about preparing data, you all know what that is. You import the data. Explore. Well, that's the exploratory data analysis or EDA we've done up till now. And then finally, we have split where you take your data and some of it you set aside because you're going to use it to test your model later on. And the rest of it you're going to be using to train your model. Uh, within the build model section, there are also three subsections and we have baseline. Baseline is where you get an idea of like, what is the minimum level of performance my model needs to achieve to in order to add value to help resolve something in this problem. Iterate is actually building the model. You build it, you check, you make an adjustment, you check, you iterate through it until you have something that you're happy with. And then when you're done with that process, you finally evaluate your model to see how it's performing. So again, this is not only the outline for our notebook, but this is really kind of a mental outline that you should keep in your, in your uh, local hard drive uh, in order to think about how to work through machine learning problems when you're, when you're working as a practitioner in the field. So that's it for the outlines. Let's clear these drawings and go back to the file picker. And then the next thing I want to draw your attentions to is the uh, imports that I have here. So let's just quickly introduce all of these new friends to you. First, let's talk about the old friends. So first, we have matplotlib and pandas. You guys already know about these two, so I'm not going to worry about it. The next two imports that I want to draw your attention okay, to. So let's stop right here and make a note about these. Uh... are these two from scikit-learn. We're importing linear regression from the linear model module. And then from scikit-learn and the metrics module, we're importing mean absolute error. And we're going to be using these particular libraries uh, for linear regression. We'll be using this to build our model. For mean absolute error, that's the way we're going to evaluate our model. And then there's one last one here at the bottom, which has to do with validation. And this is actually just a way to make sure that you've fit your model as we work through the notebook. You'll notice that I have a few check your work cells where you can kind of see if you're on the right track. That's what we're using that for. And then last but not least, we have two other imports or two other things. We import a module that's in the standard Python library. This is warnings. And the reason why we do that is we're going to be eliminating some warnings that kind of pop up. They're future warnings. They're actually not a big deal. We just don't want them to be a visual distraction to you. So that's what those two lines are for. And those are all of our new friends uh, that we'll be working with in this notebook. Okay, in the previous project, 
we can say here 2.11. Uh, who prepared data? Task 2.11. In the previous function project, we cleaned our data files one by one. This isn't an issue when you're working with just three files, but imagine if you had several hundred. One way to automate the data importing and cleaning process by writing a function. This will make sure that all our data undergoes the same process and that our uh, analysis is easily reproducible. Some, something isn't very, some, something that's very important in science in general, in data science in particular. So let's come down over here then. In our last project, we had three CSV files and they were all messy and we cleaned them one by one. Now, it wasn't a big deal because we had three files, but imagine that somebody gave you 300 CSV files. You definitely couldn't clean all of those, you know, one by one. You'd go crazy. You'd pull your hair out. Actually, that's, that's what happened to me is I pulled my hair out when I was cleaning 5,000 CSV files for a client. I'm lying. It's a joke. Anyways, the uh, thing that I want to draw your attention to is that, you know, when you have these repetitive processes, a good way to um, make them not so repetitive is to build a function. And a function allows you to do the same thing over and over again in the exact same way and basically is a time saver. It's an automator. So we're going to be working with uh, a function to import all of our data here in this particular uh, notebook. So let's take a look at that. Uh, first thing, let's just look at the data here. And notice here in the data file, we have, let me just pull it out. We have five different CSV files that we're interested in working with. Now, we'll only be working with some of them to start. But again, we don't want to clean these one by one. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's zoom in here and let's start building our function. So whenever you build a function, you start with DEF or define because you're defining your function. And then the next thing you do is you have to give your function a name. And in this case, we're going to call it wrangle because we're wrangling our data. We're getting it all in the right place and the right format. So those are the first two things you need for a function. The next thing you need are parentheses. And sometimes you don't need to put anything in these parentheses, but in this case, we need to include one thing. And if you include things in these parentheses, you call them arguments. And we have one argument that we want to include, which is the file path. Where is this file located? What is the CSV file that you want me to wrangle? And we don't need to provide a specific file path name. We just need to give a generic variable name. So we'll call that file path. And then last but not least, when you close that parentheses, we're going to put a semicolon. Uh, once you have that first part of the function done, you hit enter and notice here that we have that indent. So everything that is indented is going to be part of the function. And let's see here. There's one last thing we're going to need that all functions generally have is you have a return command. And that means you're going to return something to the user. In this case, it's going to be our processed and finished data frame. So we're going to get in a file path and then return a, a real data frame to our user. So we have the basic kind of skeleton, the basic components of a function. We're missing one thing, which is like it's not actually doing anything. So we need to add that as well. So let's just create a little bit of space here. And let's create, uh, let's give ourselves a note so we know what we're doing here. So we're going to say read CSV file into data frame. There we go. 
And how do we do that? Well, we know that we're going to have a data frame. We've always, we've already decided that it's going to be called DF. So we'll do DF and then we'll use that same importing strategies that we learned in the previous project. So we'll do PD and we'll do read CSV. And inside where we normally present, like we put the raw, the full file path here, we're actually going to just use that variable name that we declared above. Beautiful. So what we have now is we have a function that takes in input from the user, the location of a file. It then reads that file into a data frame, and then it returns that data frame to the user. All right, beautiful. So this is our function. I'm going to hit shift and enter just so that it's read into memory. And then in the next task, we're actually going to see if it works. Hey, we could just use chat and, and, and see what it says. We've written our function, and now it's time to see if it works. So let's check it out. I'm going to go to the notebook here. I'm going to scroll down, and uh, let's see here. We're right here in task two. Let's see how we actually implement this wrangle function. function. So I'm going to zoom in. And uh, if you want to call a function, you start with the function name. So wrangle, that's the name of our function. And then I want to put in the location, the file path, the place where our data is located. So I'll put in double inverted commas. I'll start with data and slash since it's in the data directory. I'll use the tab complete here. And I'll take in the Buenos Aires real estate number one.
And so what this is going to do is it's going to read in that file path and then return a data frame, and we're going to assign it to DF. Now, just one quick note here, since we're working with a bunch of different variable names. So this is a good thing to have in mind, which is, let's see here. Notice in our wrangle function that we declare a variable named DF. Now, when you're working with uh, variable names in a function, it's important to remember that that variable name, it's limited to the scope of that function. What do I mean when I say that? Well, uh, let me show you. Let me clear this here. If I create a new... I've already read in my wrangle function into memory, and if I do something like print df here down below, it's going to say, hey, I get a name error. df is not defined. And so what's happening is that df is defined within the scope of the function, just kind of within that little bit, within that little indent, everything indented there. But outside the function, it's not declared, right? It doesn't know what it is. And so here below where I declare df, that's where I'm creating a global variable called df, all right? That's kind of separate, that is separate from this local variable that I declare within the scope of the function. So that's why we have two DFs here, but they're actually, you know, different. Uh, they're not the same is what I'm saying. They're not, they don't refer to the same thing, the same object. At any rate, we now have this all set. We have our wrangle function we put in the file path. And so once we do that, what should happen is it should print the shape of the data frame and it should print the head. So let's see what happens. I'll hit shift and enter. And I get a name error here. And it says that PD is not defined. So what do you think is happening here? Why am I getting this error? Did we see this before? We did, right? So let's zoom out and let's scroll up and let's actually run all of our imports. So I'll hit shift and enter to run our imports. And then if I scroll down and try to run this cell, zooming in, all of a sudden it does work, right? So you have to import those libraries before you can use them. Now notice here, we have the shape of our data frame, and right now it's 8,606 rows or observations in 16 columns or features. And we can see that this looks pretty similar to the data that we saw in the last project, although it looks like there's a lot more stuff here, right? We have a bunch of stuff which we're going to need to be working with. It looks like we have a lot of cleaning that we need to do, basically. And then there's one more thing we need to do. If I scroll down here, Notice that we have 8,606 rows, and then here we have what's called an assert statement. And so what this assert statement is going to do is it's basically just going to check that our data frame has 8,606 rows, or has equal to that number of rows or less. And so if I hit shift and enter, what we'll see is nothing. And that's exactly what you want to see. If there was a problem, it would throw an error. But this assert statement tells us, hey, we've checked our work. Everything is looking good. So what does this mean? Well, we defined a function, and then we invoked that function to read a data frame into memory. So, or read a CSV file into a data frame. So, you know, pat on the back to us. All right, let's keep going.
our first cleaning task is to remove these observations from our data set. We're making really good progress because we have built a wrangle function and we were able to use it to import that first CSV file as a data frame. But the plot thickens because we actually want to make some changes to that data frame, a little bit of cleaning in order to conduct our analysis. So let's go over to the notebook and see what it is that we need to do. I'm going to go over to the notebook here and actually let me just zoom right in on the instructions for this particular task. Let me get my head out of the way. And if we look at this, let's see here, and I pull up my brush tool, it looks like there are kind of three different things we need to keep an eye on, or rather, it looks like what we need to do is to subset our data frame so that we're not looking at all of the properties, but just a select group. And how is that group determined? Well, it looks like there are three criteria. The first criteria here is we want to make sure, let me underline this, we want only properties that are in Capital Federal, that is to say that are in the city of Buenos Aires proper. All right, so that's the first thing we need to do. The next thing is we only want properties that cost less than 400,000 US dollars. So those are our first two criteria. And then the third one is we want only apartments. I guess there are other kinds of properties in this, uh, in this data set. So we want to take our big old data set, those 8,600 rows and bring it down to a smaller subset fitting those criteria. Now, I think the best way to do this would be to start with um, just creating a new cell and playing a little bit. And then from there, we'll take what we learn and then use that to build up our uh, data frame. And I'm going to go up here. Let me just zoom out for a sec. I'm going to create a new cell here. There we go. And let me now zoom in and let's take a little look at how we're going to do this. So the first thing that I'm interested in is I only want to look at properties that are in Capital Federal. So if I look at df.head, where can I get that information? Well, it looks like right here.
here in place with parent names. Let me scroll down here a little bit. It looks like this is where the information is. So we can see something very similar to what we saw with our Mexico data set. But we can see that the, the little administrative unit, the little political boundaries we're looking at here are here, this second item, Capital Federal. And we can see that the first uh, row in our data frame at index position zero is in Capital Federal. And then we can also see the same is true for the last, the fifth row or index position four. So we know, just like as a sanity check, that whatever we do, we want the um, we want the properties at zero and four to be in our data set. Okay, so we have this. Let's begin subsetting. So what I'm going to do is let's create a mask, and I'm going to call this mask B A for mask Buenos Aires, and I want this to be. I'm going to start with D F, and I'm going to tell pandas to look at the place with parent names column. And I know that this is a string. And so basically, I just want to check and see if this substring here, Capital Federal, is within that string. So I can start with doing str for the string operator. And then I can do contains for I'm looking for this particular substring. And then inside Capital Federal, there we go. Just saying if it's there, and let's just see what that looks like. I'm going to go mask ba and do dot head. And if we look at this, we can see that we get a series. And so what's in this series? Well, first we have the index labels, which are the same index. labels that were in our data frame. And then we have these Boolean values, true or false, which communicate whether or not that substring capital federal exists within that column. And we can see here for the rows that are index position zero and index position four, we can see that those evaluate as true. So those, so our mask is working, right? It's only looking, it's marking as true those rows that we only are interested in. So let me clear this and let's just see what it would look like if, for example, I took not mask BA, but let's say I took my data frame and then I put this here in square brackets and I said mask BA dot head. And if I hit shift and enter, it'll show me a data frame where everything in that data frame is or are properties in Buenos Aires proper. And we can see that, in fact, the first two rows, which here are index position zero and four, because we're not looking at those other rows, we can see that, indeed, these are capital a federal. And then we have a bunch of other below. So it looks like this is working. I'm very happy with this. So with that in mind, let's take...
data frame. And then I put this here in square brackets. And I said maskba.head. And if I hit shift and enter, it'll show me a data frame where everything in that data frame is or are properties in Buenos Aires proper. And we can see that, in fact, the first two rows, which here are index position zero and four, because we're not looking at those other rows, we can see that indeed these are capital a federal. And then we have a bunch of other below. So it looks like this is working. I'm very happy with this. So with that in mind, let's take, let's take the code that we just wrote and I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to scroll up to our wrangle function. Here we go. And let's begin subsetting. So let's zoom in. The first thing is I want to subset to, let me spell that right, subset to properties in Capital of Federal. There we go. And I'll do my BA mask. And then what I'll do is I'll do DF. I'll do DF equals DF. And then I'll say, all right, only show me the rows that are in the mask there or that are uh, identified as true with the mask. So if I hit shift and enter and run that cell, now my new wrangle function or my updated wrangle function is in memory and I can use it. And if I scroll down to the previous task we did before, when we weren't doing any filtering, we had 8,606 rows. Now with this new filter, we can see that we have a significantly less around
You need to either read or listen to the Bible. That's not what it says. The quote is, it takes away. So why said so he dropped off the phrase, the sins of the world? Well, probably because he didn't want to talk about sin. Because you don't want to talk about, the, the, I think the reason because you don't want to use the word sin, because sin implies because sin implies behavior, right? And you don't want to talk about you don't want to, you don't want to talk about Jesus and the behavior. I don't remember where I left off now. Around 2,500, and we have only properties in Buenos Aires. Beautiful. So we've met our. Well, the reason is because they don't want to talk about sin. That you know, they, you've got these liberals out there who don't want, who don't believe in sin. <clears throat> okay, that's a misquote. Okay, the verse is, yeah, but and see, these liberals do these subtle little changes to scripture in order to reject something. Okay, why? Because they don't, because they don't want to talk about sin. Because sin, because 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 some Christians have a trouble with the concept of sin. 
But see, here's the thing. You need to either read or listen to the Bible yourselves. That way, that way you can't be misled by false teaching. That's not what it says. The verse is the sins of the world. So the question, why did he leave off that last part? Well, I think it's because it's the word sin. They don't want to see, they don't paint Jesus being this happy-go-lucky savior who doesn't care about who, who doesn't care about people's behavior. All he loves you regard. No. Because if he doesn't take away the sins of the world, he isn't the savior. Why the reason because that's a re who who takes what takes away the sins of the world? The sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Without the concept of sin, then Jesus died for nothing, because that means you didn't he you aren't you aren't punished for your sin. And he said, Why did he? No, I think I think it's because you don't like the word sin. You you don't want to talk about sin because sin means because sin. The reference to sin means behavior, and you don't want to hold people accountable for the behavior. Well, guess what? They could go to and say, "Wait a minute, you didn't repent. How come you didn't? Yeah, yeah, but Jesus says repent and believe." Well, but the LGBTs don't want don't believe they have to don't believe they're sinning. So a gay person doesn't believe doesn't believe they're sinning. So therefore, you can't talk about sin because you don't want you may upset somebody. Well, that's not what it says. So the question is, why did he leave that part off? I think it's because of the word sin. There's a certain portion. See, see, this is exactly why the Methodist Church left over, over this type of stuff. Because if you say the sins of the world, because without that sacrifice of the sins, the, the, he, he, he accomplishes nothing. Why does he say the Lamb of God? Well, the Lamb is, is the sense that, you know, the, he is the, you know, I once heard someone say that all that Jesus did was die for our sins. Okay. All thing it was, was a sin. He wasn't, I think about that. The Christians tend to believe that, that he fulfilled all the glory, all the, all the, but he doesn't say that. Nowhere does it say that Jesus is the is the thank is the wave sacrifice. You know, the, all the other sacrifice. If what is going to go when Jesus returns, is this is the sin sacrifice. Well, now, you you need to read the Bible for yourself because he, because last night, so. Behold, I am a God. And he says, and after that,
Well, here's the thing. You need to either read or listen to the Bible for yourself. That way you can't be let this a false teacher. This is the kind of stuff that led to the split in the Catholic in, in the Methodist Church. This this type of loose interpretation of scripture. Because the whole point of the Lamb of God is the, is the sin sacrifice. Okay. Jesus, that's why he's called a Lamb of God, because he, he sacrificed. But if he don't, if we don't say that, then that means he didn't die for us. So does that mean he didn't die for our sins? Completely, the the actually, well, in this, right. First of all, the 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 exaggerated the story, exaggerated the daughters. Well, then it's, the girl never speaks. Yet in there, she speaks. And then, and then what the best part is, at the Last Supper, the man and the daughter were at the lap, not at the table. They were in the same room. as. How can you do that? How can you make this? Yeah, but see, here's the thing. You need to read the Bible. You need to read this for yourself. That way you, that way you won't be fooled by false teachers. The people who misquote scripture. Okay. The concept is, 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 is pivotal to the story of God. He didn't, he isn't simply the Lamb of God. He just takes away the sins of the world. He is the sin sacrifice. He was he's, his life was sacrificed for our sins. Without that sacrifice, our sins aren't forgiven. Yet because they're liberal and you don't want to talk about because sin implies behavior. And the liberals don't want to talk about behavior, sin and behavior, because it's a behavior sin. So for, therefore, a gay person would be sin as a sinner. But he doesn't say that. Show me in your Bible. Even the paraphrase Bible. Okay, so the trouble is, this isn't working. Then again, the next verse says, but it wasn't it wasn't Jesus who baptized us. You see, to me, words are words. I'm a little confused. When Paul says, would, it, would that include words like church? You know, the trouble is you're you you're obsessed with words. Rather than speaking a whole maybe the trouble is maybe you should instead of reading all these liberal books, maybe you should be looking for the Holy Spirit. My gosh. I certainly can't walk to watch the chosen because it'll drive me crazy. Twenty one, two. 
our first criteria, only properties in Buenos Aires proper. All right, beautiful. So let's move on to number two. In this case, we want only properties that are apartments. We want properties that are only apartments. So let's see here. I'm going to go back to where we were before to do a little bit exploration. So let's look at DF and property type. Property type, beautiful. And let's do unique to see what sorts of properties are in our data set. So if I hit shift and enter, I can see that we have three, four different types of properties. We have the apartments, the ones we want. We have houses and stores. And then PH, oh, you know what? I can't remember what this stands for in Spanish, but it's basically like a communal apartment. So we only want apartments. All right. So we need to make a mask. So let's call this mask APT, mask APT. And what we want it to do is property type equals, and I'm going to use here two equals. So it's, uh, it's equivalent to, it is exactly the same as apartment. Beautiful. And if I look at mask apt dot head, we'll see another Boolean array. And we can see that all of these are true here because, you know, all the properties, most of the properties in the first five rows here are apartments. Um, beautiful. And so what I can do is I can take this bit of code and if I zoom out and go back up to our wrangle function and I can add a new line here. Beautiful. Well, so let's see here. Next we'll do subset well, to apartments. Then, well, yeah, then you go first. You go first. Then why not you Beautiful. Be See, and actually, let's put this in uh, quotation marks so that we know we're we're trying to identify a specific string here. Beautiful. And so I'll do mask apartment. And then down below here, what I'll do is I'll just use a little ampersand or and sign. And I'll do mask apartment. I'll just add that in. So now what I'm saying is give me only those rows in the data frame where they evaluate for to true for being in Buenos Aires and evaluate to true for being Nah. You could, of course, just have done these two things directly, which doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, you, you you should be able to pull these out. You, you shouldn't have to make a mask. You should be able to just pull these things out directly. You know, maybe maybe just link them together or something like that. Okay, mask APT.
Okay. I come back up here. So we still had to do, okay. We could do the same thing here, uh, price, right? Say less than or equal to 400,000. And, 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 and. an apartment. So if I rerun this cell, now it's in memory, and if I scroll down, 
we have 25,000 rows here. And if we hit shift and enter, we can see that we're down to 2000. Beautiful. And if I scroll down to where we were kind of just playing around before, if I look at DF property type, let me just remove all of this cruft here that we don't need anymore. And I do property type unique, I should only see one value, which is apartment. So let's see what happens. Okay, only apartment. So we've done a really good job. Beautiful. So we've got our first two criteria. And then the last criteria is we want only properties that are less than $400,000. So what do you think we're going to do? Create another mask, maybe? I think so. That works for me. Yes, you're right. We're going to create another mask. Okay. So let's see here. The information for the price is in, let me just do DF head so we can just remember where it is. Ah, it's here in price. Beautiful. And we can also see there's a currency. So we can see that price and currency, we have the numerical denomination and then we have the currency. Let's just make sure that everything is dollars before we do anything. Because I would hate for us to filter and then we're actually filtering on Argentinian pesos. So that would be kind of strange. So let's look at currency first. We'll do currency unique. And we can see that we have N-A-N-N-A-R-S-T. All right, beautiful. So that's probably not the column that we want, right? Probably the column we want is not price. So the column that we want, let's actually look, take a better look at all of those columns. Let's do DF info. I'll hit shift and enter. And it's not price that we want because we can see that there are multiple currencies in the price column, what we want is the column that's price approximate USD, where everything already is dollars. So let's take that column and let's do DF. We'll do price approximate USD is less than four zero 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 zero. Beautiful. And by the way, in Python, if you ever kind of want to um, separate the uh, placeholders, you know, the hundreds from the thousands, you can use a little underscore, so it makes it a little bit easier to read. Beautiful. And we'll call this mask, we'll call... Call this mask price. So now we have three masks, and let's just see what mask... price looks like. Beautiful. True, 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 false. So here's one property that seems to be more expensive. Uh, so let's take this little bit of code and then let's go up to where we were before and let's drop it into our wrangle function. So let's see here. I'll say subset to properties.
I'm going to say Nick Juan. Oh, for the four thousand. I think we need this here. I'll go make a stab. Uh, we'll say where, uh, price approximate USD is less than 400,000. Awesome. And then I'll paste in what I had before. There we go. Beautiful. And then I'll take my mask price and I will put another little ampersand or an and symbol there and then add that to my mask. So now I'm masking on one, two, three criteria. So I'll hit shift and enter to put it into memory. And let's see. This is a, this is a beautiful thing, my friends. This is a beautiful thing.
when code works, it's the most, it's, it's a, it's a marvelous thing. Oh. Huh. See if, let's see what the number here is, the number of rows we're left with. Beautiful. I have 1,000. Let's just make a quick save here. Seven hundred and eighty-one. All right. I'm going to scroll down to where we were before. I don't think we need this cell anymore, so I'm just going to delete it. That means I'm going to hit. I'll hit D twice to delete it. And we have this assertion statement, and it says that our data frame should have no more than one thousand seven hundred and eighty-one observations. And if I hit Shift and Enter here, nothing happens, which means our data frame passes that test, passes that assertion. So we've properly subsetted our data, and now we're ready to really dive in to our exploratory data analysis. Our data is clean, or at least pretty clean, so let's start our exploratory data analysis. Let's go here to the notebook, and the first thing that we want to do is, you know, we were looking in the last project at surface area and how important that is into the price of the house. So I think it's important to look at that particular feature now, and what better way to explore it than by using a histogram. So let's do a histogram here. I'm going to use matplotlib, which we imported up above. 
So I'll do PLT hist, and then inside that, I'm going to put the column that we're interested in, which is surface area covered. No. Beautiful. And what... let's no. just hit shift and enter and see what that looks like. And that oof, nice. that's pretty ugly. Let's label our axes first before we get all bent out of shape, though. I'm going to do PLT X label. And I'll set that equal to, I'm actually just going to copy and paste this right from the instructions here. I'll do area square meters. Beautiful. And then let's also do our title. So PLT title. And let's do distribution of apartment sizes, which I'm going to copy and paste. You can't see the whole text because it's under my head, but that's okay. And I'll hit shift and enter. Okay. Awesome. So what do we see when we look at this? What do you think this means? Why does this look very different from the other histograms that we've seen so far? What's your thoughts? It's okay. And I'll hit
Mm. How odd. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Shift and enter. Okay, awesome. So what do we see when we look at this? What do you think this means? Why does this look very different from the other histograms that we've seen so far? What's your thoughts? Well, it shouldn't because it has a much higher, larger swan. You know, looking at this, we have this x-axis that's like really, really long. It goes all the way up to 60,000 square meters, and yet we can't really see anything. And we know that matplotlib creates like the axis automatically, so there must be a value in our data set that's really large. But at the same time, it looks like the vast majority of our data is here at like Like the, you know, from 100 to, you know, from 0 to, um, you know, 500 square meters, which makes sense if we're talking about apartments in, in Buenos Aires. So I think that looking at this histogram, we might have some outliers. So let's move on to the next task and see if we can identify those outliers by doing a numerical exploration of the data.
don't know if that's true or not. I think I, 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 I would be careful not to remove too many. We know that we have outliers in our data, so we need to keep wrangling, and what we need to do is we need to remove the extreme values that are on either end of our data set, whether it's a property that has no square meters, like no area, or a property that has 60. Five thousand square meters, which is a pretty big house. You got to admit, right? And before, you know, when we were talking about the spread of the data, we were talking about quartiles, like the twenty-fifth percentile, the fiftieth percentile, the seventy-fifth. Those were our quartiles. Now I want to talk about quantiles, where we're not limited to twenty-five, fifty, seventy-five, but we can choose any value between zero and a hundred percent. So let's take a look at our instructions and see exactly what we want to clip from our data set in order for it to be a little bit better for our model. So over here in the notebook, we see that we need to get, let's zoom in here. We need to get the, we want all observations that fall between the 10th or 0.1 and the 90th uh, percent quantiles. So that means that we want to eliminate the bottom 10% of our properties in terms of area and the top 10% in terms of area. So we're clipping the extremes here. Now, how are we going to do that? Let me open up a new cell down below here and let's kind of build this piece by piece. So the first thing is what's the column we're interested in? Well, that's surface area covered in square meters. And then if I want to get a quantile from a data frame, I'll do quantile, Q-A-N-T-I-L-E. There we go, quantile. And then inside quantile, the argument I give is I give them a list, so square brackets, and then I'll tell them the different quantiles that I want. So we want the 0.1 and we want the 0.9 or the 10th and the 90th, beautiful. Now let's see what that gives us. I'll hit shift and enter and I get an attribute error interesting so if i look at this attribute error it says series has no attribute like quantile quantile mm, it looks like the autocomplete caught me it looks like i've been fooled by the auto
complete. So I'll remove that misspelling that I have, quantile, and hit shift and enter. And now what it's telling me is here, 31 square meters, that's the cutoff for the bottom 10% of my properties. And then 100 square meters is the 90th cu uh, percent cutoff for my properties. So basically, I want properties that are between 31 and 100 square meters. Can you imagine there was a property that was like 65,000? Anyways. So, all right, I have these two values here. This is a series, right? So here are the index, uh, index labels. I want just the values. And I think that this would be a really good opportunity to do a little bit of unpacking like we did the other uh, with in the last project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two variables. I'll go low and high, low and high. And then let's just see what they look like. I'll do low. That gives me 31. And this assertion error blue because I've, I haven't done my uh, filtering yet. And then I'll do high here. Beautiful, 100. So now I have 31 and 100 assigned to variable names. And that is going to Uh, give me the information I need in order to create a mask. So what I can do is let's create another mask and we'll call this mask, um, we'll call this mask area, mask area. And we'll do DF surface area covered in meters squared. That's what we want. And now we'll use the between method, the between method. And then inside between, we'll put in the low and the high. Awesome. And then let's just see what our mask area looks like. I'll look at mask area dot head. There we go. So here I can see that we have two properties. that are within our bounds and looks like the other ones are not. So we're already making good progress.
progress. So let's grab this code. I'm going to copy it and then scroll all the way up to our wrangle function. Still working on the wrangle. And what I'm going to do is, let's just put this kind of as a separate line here. So let's just do a subset, beautiful. And then I'm now going to do subset, or I'll say remove outliers. Remove outliers by, and we're looking at surface area covered. There we go, surface area covered. And then I'm interested in taking the code that we had before. So I'll do copy and paste. I'll paste that in. And then I will do, let's see here. Let's just do another mask to make it easy. Let me zoom in. So I'll do DF equals DF. And then I'll do mask area, mask area. Beautiful. So once that's done, Let me zoom out. I'll hit Shift and Enter, and then I'll run the cell down below, and we'll see that we now have 1,343. Excellent. And if I scroll... ...scroll down to where we were, which is right... You know what, this cell, I guess we don't need it anymore. I'll just delete it, which is right here, that assert statement, which we failed before. And I hit shift and enter. It, voila, it passes. And so things are looking pretty good.
And with that, dear friends, I'm going to call tonight. What a day, what a day, what a day.